And before we have a reading this evening, I'm just going to say a short prayer. Heavenly Father, we come humbly before you this, this evening, Lord, before your word, and we ask, Heavenly Father, that you touch our hearts through it, Lord, to draw us nearer to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to read from, we've been doing a series on Saturday nights on Genesis. I'm going to read from Genesis chapter 4, first 15 verses. Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 to 15. I read and it says, Now Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was the tiller of the ground. In the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and of their fat, and the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you, shall, you should rule over it. Now Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond, you shall be on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out out this day from the face of the ground and I shall be hidden from your face I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth and it shall happen that anyone who finds me will kill me and the Lord said to him therefore whoever kills Cain vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold and the Lord set a mark on Cain lest anyone find him should kill him the passage uh, that we've just read deals with a number of important issues uh, why is there suffering? Whose fault is it? What is God's solution? And what happens when we don't listen to God's advice? But before we look at those specific points, there's a number of other things that uh, this passage also tells us. I'm not sure if I, the right expression is by omission. It tells us without directly telling us. Uh, and so when it begins, you know, this is the first time we read of Adam and his wife come together in a physical relationship and a child is born. And they name this child Cain. Uh, and so the first point we have to consider here is uh, this physical relationship which was created by God. And in fact, back in Genesis chapter 1, in verse 28. I'm not sure where it is now. Uh, 20, it's 28. Uh, in the verse it says, he said to Adam and Eve when he created them, he said to them, be fruitful and multiply. In other words, uh, this relationship, this physical relationship that he created for them was given to them before man sinned. So, you know, there's some people that say, well, you know, sex is something that uh, came into the world after man fell because that's when they slept together and they had a child. But in fact, they were created with this relationship, for, well, this relationship was created for them and God gave them the instruction well before they sinned, so that's not correct. That thinking is not correct. It was created for a husband and a wife to enjoy together because the command was given to them specifically and not given indiscriminately to any person that's born on the face of the earth that the physical relationship is theirs to enjoy. It was given specifically within the context of a husband and a wife. Now, that's obviously been twisted and distorted in our world today, and uh, a lot of people will say, well... Uh, it's something that's natural, isn't it? You know, why, 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 can't I, why can't it happen between two consenting adults? And why should a bit of paper give them the right to do it and if they don't have this bit of paper, they can't? Well, according to the word of God, it was reserved for the husband and the wife. Now, a lot of this is not said directly like this, but the command was given to the husband and the wife 
and here the husband and the wife engage in this activity and a child is born to them. And so there's a perversion that exists in the world which says no, it's all good, it's a natural activity and uh, there to be enjoyed, it's for man's pleasure. And there's also another type of distortion that occurs sometimes in Christian circles. And this distortion is that uh, we, we don't talk about these things. You know, sex is a dirty word. And you know, there's a section of the Christian community that says, uh, well, the only time you should really sleep with your wife is when you intend to have kids. If you're not going to intend to have kids, you shouldn't be sleeping with your wife. And none of this is given here to us because the command was given before the fall. And because it was given before the fall, it's not something that should be considered dirty or anything like that. I would see sensitivity when we're discussing these things. Um, so let's not allow the world to corrupt our view of this physical relationship and let's not allow uh, some, what shall I call them, um, very religious people corrupt it in the other direction. And you know, we're we caught in the middle, we can't talk about it, we can't think about it, even with our wives sometimes. So the first thing we're told is, this relationship was theirs to enjoy. And the next thing we're told, within this context of marriage, God gives them a gift, and the gift is that of childbirth. And this intention of God, again, was coming from the first chapter, be fruitful and multiply. So the physical relationship was given to them, and as part of that, there was offspring to come, children to come. And so God's intention for marriage speaks volumes about the context in which children are to be born. You know, it's not a case of two fathers or two mothers or two whatever today. It's a case of a man and a woman, one father, one mother, walking with God, committed to one another, and within this context, within this relationship, God provides the physical interaction they can have and provides the gift of childbirth. And they knew this. As soon as they, uh, Eve conceived and she brought Cain, uh, she named him Cain, which means acquired. And she said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. It came from God. She took it and said, this is something that God has given us. The command was given. The relationship was established as God said it should be established. And within this relationship, there's a gift of childbirth. And so Cain was born and then she had a second son, Abel, and we're not told here what the name Abel means, but the meaning of the word Abel is breath. It means new life. A new person came into their family. And David puts this in his Psalm 127. It says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. So this relationship that God created and the result of this relationship that God created are all gifts from God. They're not, you know, today it says, oh, well, this is, we can explain this by biology. You know, there's two cells, they share DNA, and then there's an embryo that forms, and you know, a lot of the science uh, creates this a definition of what life is. But God says this is a gift that he gave a husband and a wife. Now, this doesn't mean that God sometimes says, uh, you're good enough, I'll give you children. You're not good enough, I won't give you children. What it tells us is that our biology with its imperfections sometimes allows us to have children, sometimes doesn't allow us to have children. But what it really means is God gave us the gift of childbirth within the context of a married relationship. And if our biology permits us to have children, that's great. If it doesn't, we have a problem. But it's not God's problem withholding his gift. He's given the gift and we live with the ability to have children. And so the physical relationship from God the gift of childbirth, also a gift from God. And therefore, we conclude that life, which God created when he created Adam and Eve, and God gave the gift of life to a husband and a wife to have children, life is sacred. It comes from God and it returns to God. And it's not, you know, kids aren't an accident. They're not an inconvenience. They're not a burden, although sometimes they can become all those things. And it's not the woman's choice whether she keeps a child or not according to God's word. God provides this as a gift to a husband and a wife. Now the world has twisted all this and explains it all in terms of biological functions and physical needs and all the rest of it, but here they understood what God had said about being intimate, the two of them. They understood what God had said about providing life through them, that would be fruitful and multiply, and the naming of the children reflects that. And this leads us now to 
we have to ask ourselves a series of questions as a result of the, all this, because you know, we're in chapter four, and we haven't had much of the discussion between them, apart from when they sinned against God, they rebelled against God. We don't have much of a discussion between them about what had, God has said to them or what they knew or what they didn't know. There wasn't a previous generation to learn things from, and yet we see here they know all about the birds and the bees. Um, you know, we have parents around us, and they give some advice. We pick up a lot of things from school, and these days people who have a lot of things and terrible things from the internet. So we know all the birds and the bees stuff. How did they know about pregnancy? And when Eve's stomach started popping out, why wasn't she concerned? But how did she know that she was with child? And how did they know how to do it in the first place? How did all this knowledge come about? Uh, how did they know what to do when the child came? Yeah, you know, we have our prenatal classes today that tell you, tell the husband, hold the hand, say, breathe, you're doing well, honey. And I got told off by the nurse because I wasn't doing it enough when F was delivering her baby. What did they have? How did they know what to do? You know, there's no mother to tell her daughter about the monthly cycle and all the other stuff that they had to know. Uh, there was no, as I said, prenatal and postnatal classes, how to deal with the baby. There were no midwives. Who cut the umbilical cord? How did they know whether they should do that or not? Uh, how did they know how to deal with the arrival of the new child? And for the mothers who have breastfed their kids and have problems breastfeeding, how did they know how to do this and not have problems with it? And what about hygiene and food preparation? And at which point do you give them solids and how do you deal with nappy ration? All the other things that we know today because we think we're educated, sophisticated, we have all the services around us. How did they know what to do until the kid was old enough to be able to walk and become independent Without all the psychology that we have today, there was no James Dobbs and the focus on the family back then, all the resources we have today. Another thing, you know, today we have all the resources to tell us to teach our kids resilience, to be able to stand in the face of bullying. They didn't have any of that. It was just the two of them and their first kid came. Where does all this knowledge come from? And this shouldn't be, and also all the sophistication of medical advances today and all the advice today, um, and this, we have it today, they didn't have it back then, and this doesn't mean, you know, you don't need medicine today, and uh, off you are, do your home birth, or whatever birth you want to do, whatever the latest trend is, it doesn't mean any of that. But I'm just asking the question, how, in two verses, do we get that they knew all about how to have children, what to expect when a child came, how to give birth, how to separated from the mother and feed it and clothe it and do all the things they had to do, breastfeeding, everything that they had to do, how did they know all this as the first parents? Now we know some things that they knew because we see them a little bit later on in this chapter, also in previous chapters, they knew they had to dress head to toe because God dressed them, so God told them how to do that. They also knew about sacrifices because we have them here, uh, Adam, uh, Abel sacrificed the lamb, so there's a shedding of blood, the sin sacrifice, there was Cain's uh, offering, sacrifice, the fruit of the ground. So there was an offering to God of the fruit of the ground. So they knew about some of these things, but had not know all these other things. And they learnt it all from their conversations with God. Remember every afternoon they'd walk and they'd meet God in the garden, the cool of the day, and there were conversations. They must have, God must have explained a lot of these things to them. We're not given, we're not, we don't have what the conversations were, but God must have explained all these things as he explained some of the things about being obedient to God, about working the ground and all the other things that God explained to them. And in turn, Adam and Eve must have taught their children and it's almost implied in this chapter, if you go back and read the verses we read earlier, that maybe God still spoke to Adam and Eve in some sort of context and Cain heard that because God had come speaking to Cain, so God didn't stand distant or wasn't as we experience him today through his word. There was some communication. So maybe God explained all these things to them and they were able to understand. Um, and so all this wisdom that they had was passed on to their children and then to the subsequent generation and the subsequent generation and to all generations thereafter. And so you know, this obviously tells us that the first man wasn't a caveman who dragged his wife to the cave by the hair. That's what I was told when I was at primary school. 
uh, this tells us that man was indeed very intelligent and that because of his relationship with God, God taught him everything he needed to know about life, how to deal with his own family, how to deal with all the things he had to encounter in life. So he was incredibly intelligent pertaining to this life and his relationship with God. Now, over the centuries, believing the lie of the devil, that the devil knows better than God, uh, we've ended up, well, the devil has largely managed to beat this intelligence out of us today. And today we think we're very sophisticated, but we don't know a lot of things and we rely on all those around us to tell us a lot of things because we've lost all that knowledge. Man knows so little today because he's abandoned to every essence of what I call common sense. Common sense which all of us had, man had from the beginning, and instead of developing that, he's adopted a new way of thinking, the group think of the world. Now this is what the God describes as, the word of God describes as the course of this world, the thinking of this world. So he's adopted that sort of thinking, and this is the way of the world. But the ability to know and understand and reason things in our mind again is a gift from God because the first couple had it and God spoke to them and he explained things to them and so they were able to understand and they were able to communicate this to their children and subsequent generations because we have this common sense that keeps continuing on uh, through life so the first couple knew all this very well and now we're playing catch up we're trying to regain common sense but the problem today is we're doing it in the framework, the world's doing it in the framework, independent of God. And when it's independent of God, there's all sorts of problems we get ourselves into because we don't have a framework on which to build what we know to be correct and to support it from the word of God. And so there's another question that comes out of all this. And the question is, and we need to address and need to understand is, where does common sense come from? You know, this aspect to be able to think and to reason you know, there's a lot of things that are written in the Bible, that's great, and there's a lot of things that aren't written in the Bible, but we still consider them to be common sense. You know, where does this common sense come from? Where, this, where, all this thing coming, comes, where does all this come from? You know, there's a lot of Christians that say, if it's in the Bible, I believe it. If it's not in the Bible, forget about it. And I would venture to say, to argue that some Christians suffer from a very terrible sense of arrogance. Common sense is not the domain of Christians only. Some Christians do not display much common sense at all. Common sense is what God instills into each person as they're, when they're born from the beginning of time to today. And there's this little voice in our head that we call our conscience that tells us what is right and wrong. And this common sense that God instills into every person, we can build on it and bring it in line with the word of God and develop it and refine that skill so we are discerning and can hear God when he speaks to our heart, when he he pricks our conscience through his word, through the Holy Spirit, or we can uh, allow the world to beat, us, beat it out of us and dumb us down. In Proverbs 22, 17, uh, Solomon says, incline your ear and hear the words of the wise. Now, Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived. And we know that because God declares that of him. And yet Solomon says, incline your ear and hear the words of the wise. There were wise people around at the time and they had wise words. In a chapter later, a couple of chapters later, in 24, 23, it says, these things also belong to the wise. You know, there's a body of common sense literature, wisdom, that everyone knows, and we understand it to be wise, common sense, and it's not the domain only of those who profess to be Christians, who profess to have the word of God. It stands because it emanates from God, it comes from God, and it's instilled within each of us. Solomon compiled all these wise sayings from many different sources, and we don't know all the sources. He says, it's just a collection of wise sayings. I've accumulated them and I've put them together. And the last two chapters of Proverbs, chapter 30 and 31, I think they're the last two chapters, are from two individuals, Agur and Lemuel, respectively, and we have no idea who they are. There's some speculation as to who they are, but we don't know who they are. So there were a lot of wise sayings that Solomon collected, and wise means uh, the source ultimately comes from God, that's the common sense that God instills into every person, and works with our conscience to help us understand what it is that God wants from us. Uh, we can allow the world 
to sear our conscience, to uh, deaden our conscience so uh, it no longer speaks to us. And it happens to a lot of people. And they do all sorts of terrible things and they can't see they're doing anything wrong. So we can allow that to happen to us and we can ignore it. This voice inside that speaks to us and convicts us, we can ignore it uh, and our conscience, uh, and when we do that, we extinguish this little voice and Paul says, do not extinguish the spirit. It's no longer audible. And that's why when we come to the New Testament, the commandment, the instruction from Paul is, test all things. Hold fast what is good. There's a body there of things which are good. And there's obviously a body of things which are no good. And here we have uh, before us the background for the first problem this family encounters. They knew what was right. It was communicated to them by God. The parents communicated to their children, and maybe God spoke to their children as well. So they had this understanding of what is right, and they had this understanding of what wasn't right. And Adam and Eve probably explained to the kids, we really stuffed it up when we ate from that tree that God said, do not eat, and now we live with the consequences of that. And so we're presented with all this background to the first murder that occurs in the history of mankind. And this occurs uh, after chapter, after verse 5, I think, right? Verse 5 or verse 6. Verse 8, sorry. Um, so a man was instructed by God, instructed by his parents, and now he has to face life. Now that's what happens, right? We try and teach our kids to do, the kids to do all the right things and try and instruct them in the ways of God, but at some point they've got to make decisions for themselves and we can't control that, process, that time when they make those decisions. And it's probably the most frustra frust frustrating time in a parent's life. And you see kids making decisions and you think, what is wrong with them? Can't they understand? So many hours I've spent talking with them. And, and they, they don't because they have to make decisions on their own. And you know, we've tried our best. Uh, and we, sometimes we can create a whiff for our back saying, we haven't done our best. I should have done this and I should have done that. But God's word tells us there comes a point in the life of every person where they have to make decisions for themselves. And this point uh, is where Cain finds himself. Yeah, he's been going through the routine of living his life and you know, he was uh, sacrificing, he knew about sacrifices. Um, his sacrifice wasn't accepted by God. How did he know that his sacrifice wasn't accepted by God? You know, God doesn't appear to tell him, I don't accept your sacrifice. God appears a little bit later on to say to him, why are you angry, Cain? If you do well, won't I accept your sacrifice, you and your sacrifice? Why wasn't, how did Cain know that he wasn't accepted by God and his sacrifice wasn't accepted by God. It's because that inner voice that co it convicts us and tells us you're not doing what's right. And we know this was a play in Cain's life because no one had said anything to him and he was angry. Why was he angry? What was he angry about? He knew what he was doing was wrong and he knew he wasn't accepted by God and he knew his brother was accepted by God. How do you know all that? Because God speaks to people. He convicts us through our conscience. And we have to protect that part of our lives and not allow the world to deaden it, to sear it, to deafen it, so they can't hear God's voice anymore. That's how God communicates through us. That's how he communicates through his word to us. It speaks to us. It challenges us. It convicts us. It's a mirror. And when that voice within is deadened, is, uh, is seared, then there is no communication. It's a very difficult time to be communicating with God. So our conscience speaks to us when the Spirit of God convicts us, and the Spirit of God was convicting Cain. And Cain was arcing up. He was angry, because he knew. This is a conviction of the Holy Spirit. It reminds us of God's standard in our lives. And we also see here that some people can choose to arc up against it and fight against the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And others can choose to listen. If we don't listen, if we ignore, it's to our detriment because we extinguish the voice of God in our lives. So Cain's conscience spoke to him well before God spoke to him. And Cain, in his mind, instead of listening to his conscience, listening to the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God in his life, he, turned not, he chose not to listen and to get angry with Abel. And so Cain is moved by anger to murder his brother. What if what 
excuse me, what influenced Cain to move to murder his brother? Where had he seen a murder before? Which violent movie was it? Violent computer game, video game? What evil company did Cain have to learn that you can resolve your problem, you just get rid of your brother? Well, you know, this is a problem that we have in society today. Everyone's looking to point the finger at someone, something to say that's what the problem is. You know, it was your toilet training, it was your upbringing, it was your, your bullet at school, it was your parents, it was your church, it was all the things that we would like to point the finger at. And God says, just hold up for a moment. It's none of those things. It's a wrong question to ask whose fault is it. Because the conviction came. Cain, and you didn't listen to the conviction. And you acted out your anger. Don't blame your brother because he's a, what's the expression, a goody two-shoes or whatever it is. Don't, don't blame your brother for it. Don't blame God for it. It's not your sacrifice, Cain, because God says you would be accepted and your sacrifice would be accepted. Stop blaming. Stop looking for a scapegoat to blame. It's not anyone's fault. But that's what drives a lot of what we have in society today. Everyone wants to know whose fault it is when a tragedy happens. You know, he was such a nice boy. He was such a quiet fellow. Who would know they would shoot whatever number of people he shot at the local school or whatever he did? You now, what drives many of these social problems today? You know, violence against women, big problem, alcohol, drugs and pornography and all sorts of abuse and suicide and all these things. And I was, as I was thinking about this, I was reminded of a time when uh, outside church quite a few years ago now, uh, a man with a, a, a veteran, a war veteran, with his uh, bag over his shoulder came past and was asking for money. And I thought as a young Christian then I'd be very smart and say, look, uh, what would you like the money for? And he says, oh, look, uh, just to get a train so I can go home. I said, uh, is that really what you want the money for? And he got angry with me. I said, what do you think I want the money for? I'll tell you what I want the money for. I want to buy another bottle of wine. I don't have anything else in this world. Will you give me some money so I can buy a bottle of wine? I said, look, I can't do that. Why are you doing this to yourself? Again, I thought I was really smart. You know? what are you, why are you doing this to yourself? So what do you want me to do? I said, you've got to take responsibility for your life. You know, bad things have happened to you. And he lifted up his shirt, all the bullet holes and wounds that he had in his stomach from the war. And uh, you know, I was trying to explain to him, you have to take some responsibility for your life. You know, we can help you do that, but I can't give you money for alcohol. Because I'll tell you what, and he opens his bag, he pulls his bottle of wine out, a half bottle of wine, he pours it out in the gutter, and he puts a bottle down in the gutter and says, now what are you going to do for me? And I was a bit stuck because I never expected him to do that. Now what do you do to someone who takes the first step to do the right thing? And so I went down to St. Vincent's de Paul, they have a detox centre just opposite the children's hospital, and he walked in with him, and the guy behind the counter says, Patrick, you're back again. I thought, what hope is there for a person like this? So anyway, I went inside. I said to him, I'll come back tomorrow to visit you. And he said, right, OK. So the next day, I went back with a couple of tracts about you know, being discouraged and disillusioned in life. And I came in, and he was in his room, and he had the shakes because he was going through detox. And uh, he said, you came back. He said, I told you, I'd come back to visit you. I can't but come back tomorrow, but I'll come back, I think it was a Tuesday, I'll come back on Thursday. And he said, you know, where's your family? He goes, oh, they're in Queensland, they don't want to know me. I said, but if you, if you continue like this, you can understand why they don't want to know you. Why don't you do something about your life? Now, why don't you listen, why don't you read some of this material that I've brought to you? And I explained to him in simple words, the gospel. And I said goodbye, I said, I'll see you on Thursday. I went back on Thursday, but he was gone. I'm not sure whether he went back to Queensland, whether he's back out on the streets, I'm not sure where he was. How do people end up like that? And why do people end up like that? And you know, all these problems in society. He was prepared to blame Vietnam and you know, all the injuries that he got and his family who had abandoned him and all the rest of it. And it's easy to blame the past, our parents and our relatives and religion and a lot of things. But we can't get ahead. We can't put our head in the right place until we start addressing, addressing the underlying problem that exists in every person's life. And God goes on to uh, explain to us here what that problem is. And it doesn't sit, uh, the fault doesn't sit with someone else or something else. The fault is, or the problem is, within. It's a power of sin within. And sin is not a very popular word these days, 
and unfortunately even amongst Christians is not a very popular word, but that's why Jesus Christ came and he died on the cross. It's because of our sin. So the Bible tells us, and we saw this when we were covering chapter 1 of Genesis, uh, chapter 2 sorry, of Genesis, that sin causes a lot of problems in our lives. It separates us from God and they went hiding in the bushes rather than waiting to meet God. It causes tension between people. Your fault, you gave me to eat. No, the snake gave me to eat. God, you, created, you made the snake, it's your fault. It causes disease and decay and all the things that we live with today and have to put up with today. And it also causes inner t- turmoil within us. There's all the psychological problems that are created, this inner turmoil that darkens the soul. And this is now becomes part of our brokenness. We have to deal with all these things, some more, some less, to a lesser extent. We have to deal with these things because it's part of our brokenness. Why didn't God look favourably at Cain's offering? You know, a lot of discussion here, well, Cain offered a sin offering, Cain offered some grain, so Abel offered a sin offering, Cain offered some grain, uh, God wanted the sin offering, but we're not actually told that. Because Cain offerings were also... Sorry. Cain's offering of the fruit of the land was also an offering that God accepted in a different context. It wasn't for sin, it was other things. And so, yeah, it was because, and God explains here, if you do well, then you will be accepted and your offering will be accepted. So there's an aspect of Cain's life which God was not happy with. That's, that's sorry, putting it very superficially. There's an aspect of Cain's life that was sinful before God and God could not accept Cain's offering because of the sin in Cain's life. Now, we're not told what it is. It could be just this harbouring of this anger towards his brother. It could be things that we're not told. Um, but you know, there's a number of lessons here for us as well. You know, we can hide our hearts from one another, and we do that very well, but God can see right through us, right? No one knew Cain was angry with his brother. There was only four of them in the world. How can you hide in a crowd of four people, in the same household. And Cain could see right, uh, God could see right through Cain. Uh, we may approach God with whatever things we want to offer him and sacrifice toward him, towards him, and he still sees through us because uh, they're not a smokescreen for God. They're a smokescreen for other people. Remember in the first church, Ananias and Sapphira, oh, we'll sell their property as well because that would have become as popular as the others that sold their property. God saw through that. The others thought, oh, this is amazing. Another couple that wants to sell their property and support the... No, God saw through all that. And God sees through, all the, all, through everything that we do. And he's not obliged to accept our offering. Because David said, if you wanted offerings, if you wanted sacrifices, you want a broken and contrite heart. And Cain did not have that. Instead of sitting back... Uh, yeah, sometimes we say amongst ourselves, we give advice to one another, and um, the advice is not taken, and you wait for that opportunity when the problem happens in the person you've been speaking to, and you want to say to them, I told you so, didn't I? Didn't I tell you? There it is. You didn't listen to me, it's happened to you. Well, God doesn't do that. He doesn't sit back and wait uh, and delight in Cain's plight and wait there till Cain killed his brother and then said, you sinner, you're damned for life and whatever else. We might behave like that sometimes. But God is not like that. Even before Cain said anything, before Cain acted on anything, before there was any prompting from anyone else, God came to Cain. And he does this because we're in Ezekiel 33, 11. As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? The Lord didn't accept Cain's sacrifice, but neither did God stay silent. He came to Cain, and God never remained silent. He came to Cain, and he prompts Cain to stop and think about what he's about to do. Because God can see it coming, and he wants to stop Cain. and said to Cain in verse 6, Why are you angry, and why is your countenance fallen? God knew why. Cain was angry and why his countenance was fallen. Why was God, why was Cain angry? Why did he, why, why was he upset? You know, why is the world upset with Christianity, angry with Christians, 
angry with God. It's the same reason that we're going to see in Cain. And God tells Cain, if you do well, will you not be accepted? See, Cain's heart was condemning him that he wasn't doing well. Abel's life was condemning Cain that he wasn't doing well because he could see Abel's life as an example of what it means to be connected, to be in the right relationship with God, and he could see that he wasn't. And instead of listening to that voice within to say, I have to change, I must do better. Because in those days, that's what God expected of them. They had to change, they had to do better, they had to offer sacrifices, seek forgiveness for their sins. Instead of saying all those things, Cain turns to anger. The condemnation he felt within didn't draw him closer to God, it drew him to anger. And this was what happens today. As Jesus Christ says in John 3, verse 19 to 21, And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than the light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they've been done in God. So despite not wanting to come to the light, not wanting to submit himself to God, God comes to Cain and says, Cain, stop and think, why are you angry? Why is your face on the ground, your, lip, your bottom jaw on the ground? What are you doing? What's wrong with you? Uh, and despite this warning and God's hope coming to Cain that he would wake up to himself, stop and reconsider, Cain continues rejecting the conviction within, rejecting the conviction that was coming from Abel, his brother, and rejecting now the voice of God directly speaking to him, not just some voice within, but now hearing God saying, why are you angry? What are you doing with yourself? Instead of doing all that, and this, this is a good sign when, when, we, when we are convicted by God, right? It's good when we're convicted by God. It doesn't feel good, but it's a good sign that God still speaks. And God still speaks to mankind today. But Cain, instead of listening to the voice, he gave away the anger. And that's why God asks him, why are you angry? And that's a natural response to conviction, right? Uh, we don't like being convicted. It bursts our, it pricks our uh, bubble of pride. Um, and anger was Cain's way of dealing with it, and anger is often man's way of dealing with it. How else do we explain the antagonism towards Christian principles and Christianity today? And sometimes we give them the right because we don't behave appropriately, but generally it's because it's light and it convicts, and man doesn't want to be convicted. And we avoid being people who tell us what we don't want to hear. Remember uh, King Ahab and the prophet Micaiah. Uh, King Ahab said, I hate him because he never says anything good about me. Uh, and this was, according to Ahab, uh, Ahab's testimony, this was a prophet of God. I hate this guy because he never says anything good about me. He knew he was a prophet of God. What do you make of Balaam who hit his donkey? How many times have you heard a donkey speak? Don Balaam the donkey spoke. But he was so blinded by desire to get the gain that was offered to him, he hit his donkey because the donkey was getting in the way of his payment. Anger blinds us to God's message, to God's voice, and we often shoot the messenger. That's what often happens in the world around us today. And the prompting from God's word is today, if you hear the voice of the Lord, do not harden your heart. And even at this point where Cain says nothing to God, well, what can you say? God could see right through you. No one else knew he was angry, bitter at his brother, but God did. And God still doesn't remain silent, still doesn't shut the door on Cain and say, as soon as you do it, you're a dead man, Cain. But he doesn't leave in darkness and he prompts Cain with a solution. He prompts Cain with some advice because the Lord was interested in Cain's heart and not so much his servants, his servants, his service. Let me have a drink of water. And he does the same today. He prompts man and he provides man with a solution. And he says to Cain, careful Cain. I've got to read it so I don't quote it incorrectly. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, uh, in verse 7, and if you do not do well, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Sin stands at the door, Cain. 
It wants to control you. It wants to take over your life. Stand up and don't let sin do that to you. Because God could see what was coming and God's trying to explain to Cain, your problem is not Abel, your brother. And your problem is not your sacrifice. The problem is you don't do well. There's things in your life which are not, not right. And if you do well, won't your sacrifice be accepted, Cain? Stop and think, Cain. Sin stands at the door. The door is shut at the moment. And it wants to control your life. Don't open the door to sin. That's the advice God gives man today. That sin is like the camel. If you were to give this example, you have a camel and you have a tent. And the camel sticks its foot in the tent. And before you know it, the whole camel's in the tent and you're outside the tent because that's how it works. Uh, and that's how it works with sin as well. You give a little bit and it is not satisfied with a little bit. The devil is never satisfied with a little bit. And we think often we can handle ourselves and we're in control of the situation and we're definitely not in control of the situation because the only part we can control sometimes, sometimes, is our part and is the other part which is controlled by the devil and all the machinery, the demonic machinery working in the world around us today. And we can't control that. So we don't have to give an inch. Because when we do that, we expose ourselves to all the damage that sin does in a man's life. And when we're talking to ourselves as Christians and Jesus Christ died for our sin, it's even, it's a, there's an even stronger message here for us to be careful to not go back to the things, to this thing, this disease of sin, which takes control of our lives. But to listen to the conviction of God in our hearts, not to arc up, not to shoot the messenger, but to submit to God and ask him to help us to deal with it, to keep that door shut, not to allow sin to come into our lives. So the real question for us is how do we respond when sin stands at our door? And we know it stands at our door because the conviction within tells us. And sometimes there'll be a message you hear from someone that reminds you. That's the message that God gave Cain. And God's desire is that we don't succumb to sin, but we stay righteous and live holy lives because he's given us the power to do that. And these words the pain, and you shall, um, verse 7, but you should rule over it with the power of the Holy Spirit. That can be a reality. It should be a reality in our lives. So let's not ignore the conviction of the Holy Spirit and all the damage that happens in our lives because we think the sophistication of the world around us is more enlightening. All the good that may exist in the world around us comes from God. It's instilled in man the time he's born. If we don't protect it, we lose it, and we're forever playing catch-up the rest of our lives. And God's word here for me is telling me, and hopefully telling you, protect that heart of yours, the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Don't let your heart go dull, be hardened. Uh, don't, let, uh, the, don't let the voice of the Holy Spirit be extinguished. And this decision isn't a one-off decision. It's a daily decision because our battle with the enemy is on a daily basis. I remember reading a story about some royalty in England once, many, many years ago, when they used to drive around stagecoaches. Um, and that was their mode of transport. And they had for a coachman to be able to drive this person, uh, uh, carry this person around to different places. And some of the places were very tight roads on the sides of mountains, you know, very close to, close to the cliffside. And so uh, the interview process started and the royalty was doing the interviewing and asked uh, various people that came for the interview job one at a time, uh, why should I employ you and what are your credentials and your experience? And uh, a number of them said, I can come to within a quarter of an inch, because in England they still have inches, right? A quarter of an inch, the edge of the cliff. And the, the, the cart, the, the coach will stay on the road. It won't go over. And one of the guys, the question, you know, why should I employ you? What happens if you go on a very tight road on the cliff, on the edge of the mountain? He goes, I know to keep as far away from the cliff as I can, just in case something happens and we go over. And that guy got the job, because that's what... The, world, the person that was employing him wanted to hear. They want to hear how close you can get to the edge, how far you can keep from the edge. That has to be our thinking. 
That has to be what dominates our thinking. Not how close I can get, how far I can keep away from sin. Because sin, the desire of sin is to control me. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, I can shut the door on sin and keep it shut because God gives me that power. May God bless his word in our hearts. Let's pray. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the time that we had together. And we ask, Lord, please help us, Lord, to dwell and to meditate on your word, which inspires, Lord, and draws us nearer to you. We ask these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.